This morning, we decided to take a walk along the Guanshan Canyon, located next to a large park called Chama Gudao, the same name as the ancient tea horse road. We've already visited Chama Gudao on our last trip, but not the Guanshan Canyon in particular. It's a fairly long walking route and we did not have time for it then. Trails like this are quite common in China, so today we'll have a walking tour. Also, the weather is fine. Here is the entrance to the canyon. This used to be a paid entrance, and everything is organized much like they do with a typical Chinese tourist attraction. Fences for a queue, a waiting bench, the ticket office, a map with a description, even some information in English. Now, as they say, it is Meizen Guanli. My favorite word on this trip is the word Guanli, meaning to guard, maintain, observe, protect or care. But so far none of this has been happening here, because few tourists come and the Chinese are opportunistic. If there's no tourists, then what's the point of hiring a bunch of staff? Therefore now the entrance is free. I heard from some locals that these lands were sold to a company which is going to make some advertising and invest some money in it. And tourists will come here and then they will start to make money for the entrance. But now we still have a chance to go here for free and see this place with our own eyes. The best part is not even the fact that it's free, but the lack of people here. Because this is indeed a rare phenomenon in China. Ahead of a beautiful canyon with the purest water, where you can see fish at the bottom, lies the forest, very humid and pleasant, especially in the extreme heat in the middle of summer. Here we noticed the first wild tea bush. I recognized it by the leaf, then looked at the trunk, at the tips, and everything became clear. This is how wild bushes are found all over China. They look about the same coming in different sizes, for example, large tea trees. In general, the tea plant in China feels good in the wild. What I like most about the parks in China is that the routes that we would probably qualify as challenging or even of high complexity here are considered to be ordinary. A chain along a cliff, a lattice, and that's it. The height is not so dramatic, of course. Yet for an unprepared traveler it seems scary and uncomfortable, especially if it's a person with disabilities. This isn't implied in any way or form, and no supervision is made. Parks of Henan have objectively difficult routes. But every time I see a girl in high heels or old people casually walking along them, I admire this national spirit of mountain climbing. Well, it's not unusual considering that 70% of China is occupied by mountains. During rains, the water level rises right up to this stone. A very turbulent flow, there's no vegetation downstream. That's why there are closing gates with barbed wire, which do not allow tourists to climb here during the rainy season. But apparently there are many people who try despite the fact that it's very dangerous. Here, in addition to a strong flow, water carries stones and branches and so on.
нашли мы тетушку, которая тоже делает местный этот лайча. We met a lady who also makes a local lycha. I remember yesterday's, which was too milky for my taste. So I decided to add some more tea leaves because we wanted to be a tea-based drink, not just soy milk and nuts. Let's make lay chai in a moi chai style. Why are you putting so much tea? asked the lady. And I answer, let's try, maybe it's better this way. Now we have it well smashed. Here I see there's a life hack. They tie up this wand which is usually loose so that it doesn't fall on tourists passing by. Who wants to pump up his hands and do some useful work? Come to Hanan for three months in the tourist season and cook this stuff. Well, now that's more like it. I'm knackered. In Hanan, they offer such local snacks as pickled daikon, for example. It's interesting to know that daikon means carrot in English. A carrot, as we know it, is called a red daikon. As well, there's some local onion and some kind of garlic. Hanan cuisine is quite spicy, but not as spicy as in Sichuan. After the Fujian cuisine, which is not terrible, but still quite flavorless, we were extremely pleased to take a bite on something a little spicier. Now the hostess will add some soy milk and water to the slush. And we'll try later. Everyone has their own recipe. And you can make it sweet or salty or even bitter if you want. Here comes the milk. The hostess brings us fried rice already with peas, plus a little bit of peanuts and spices. I hope that it's good. If you ask me, if you added more tea, it would be even better. But it's much tastier than the one we had yesterday. The rice is better too. Such a drink is perfect in the heat. The recipe is extremely simple, as I said. You pound some ginger with fresh tea leaves, then add a little milk mixture, perhaps soy milk, some water, and some cereals, and in the end a dash of fried rice. The common occupation of farmers in these mountains is the production of maocha. It can be found everywhere. In this case, maocha being a semi-finished product, which is then further processed for the production of pressed and loose heicha. A big difference from sheng where you can drink sheng maocha straight away. But maocha for heicha requires further processing because this tea is not full of flavor yet. Yesterday, we had an opportunity to feel the difference during our tea tasting session. This is especially the case with those varieties of HR which imply stronger fermentation. 
and are closer to Shupoer in terms of technology. The main difference is that the fermentation occurs in two stages. The first one during the production of Mao Cha and the second one during further processing. Now, Mao Cha is laid out here to dry and at the same time is harvested. Once the space is free, a new batch is laid out. Therefore, the production possibilities are not limited so much by the small area of the tea plantings or by some difficulties of harvesting, but by the shortage of space for drying. Here in the mountains it's hard to set up a large space for drying. Often they construct special sheds along the rivers for this purpose. This is a parking area by the river, probably for the residents or guests. But at the moment, as you can see, everything is occupied by tea. We arrived at another place which was set up just a year ago. It's some kind of Chama Gudao memorial. Why do I say set up? Because in fact the ancient tea horse road did not pass exactly here. But since Chama Gudao is already a brand, this name is used for any remarkable tourist place of this area. Therefore, there are several such resorts with the same name, recently landscaped with paths in the mountains. For the sake of truth, the routes of the Tea Horse Road did really pass somewhere near here. But whether it was along this particular path is debatable. Many authentic trails lie in extremely distant places, but some are easier to travel to. If one wonders whether it was here or there that the ancient Tea Horse Road passed, then here's the thing. From any village where hay char was made, and is still produced to this very day, the tea was somehow exported. The question is if these trails were the centre of transportation, or was it just a small segment? Every place where hay char is produced is somehow related to the Chama Gadao. Most of the hay char produced here was sent to Tibet on a vast extensive road network. The trail runs along this picturesque canyon, and many people come here not so much to touch the history of the tea way, but just to be in nature. A wild forest grows here, and its devastation is prohibited, so many ancient trees are preserved. The coolness of the canyon brings a bliss, and it is the main reason that most travelers come here. Often I find these inscriptions that meet the park visitors to be quite cringy. Such a lovely board with general info and rules. If this place has any historical value, it contains the information about the dynasty during which it was found and some important historical facts. Many natural monuments are now experiencing a rebirth because there are many people in China and there's a demand for such places of recreation. At the same time, many people want to earn some money, and therefore we witness a purely poetic description, and not a single particularly interesting fact, besides the fact that there is beautiful nature here. Actually, this board is useless. Most likely they just copied its content from some advertising brochure. Unexpectedly, the road ended, and we were just preparing for the ascent into the mountains. Either the route has not yet been fully completed, or it's just a small one, but its beginning seemed much more decent. I've witnessed the evolution of many such parks, both in Anhui and Fujian, and here as well. 
Often they open to the public, being half ready. And it's not uncommon to observe various construction processes during the visit. These unfinished areas are not protected. You can walk and take pictures. We'll now go back and take a trip to the HR State Museum, which was founded quite recently. I think it would be interesting to see. This is how traditional HR packaging is made. We're in the village where all residents specialize in the production of such packaging, since tea does not grow here due to the unsuitable hot environment. This is a small factory, just two or three workers who are engaged in cutting thin strips from a bamboo stem. Not a long time ago, all this was done manually, now they use machines for convenience. But it's still stitched by hand, because it's impossible to make it mechanically. A lady next to me is now in the middle of this process. The most traditional form of HRT is a log, and these logs come in different sizes. 100 liang, about 3.7 kilos, 1,000 liang, 37 kilos, and 10 liang, etc. You can often see it in stores that specialize in HR. There are two logs at the entrance, on the right side and on the left side. Usually these particular logs are in a classic form, 1,000 liang, kian liang. We have kian liang bin tea for sale and that is the tea which was cut from a log of 1,000 liang. I hope that later we'll be able to see how the tea is packed into the logs. On the packaging itself you can see bamboo ties which, if pulled, shrinks the whole structure. This occurs after the tea is placed inside. Before that the tea is additionally wrapped in bamboo leaves. And these baskets, in fact, are semi-finished products which are subsequently supplied to the production where the HR is packed into logs. The main part of the museum's exposition is dedicated to the history of the factory, where machine tea production was introduced for the first time. Here is a bust of the founder of this factory. It was founded in 1917, and in 1949 the ownership was transferred to the state. Peaceful liberation, they call it. In China, the revolution and all the events that took place after the first year are called liberation, meaning the transfer of property to state ownership. Here are some of the milestones, such as the first experiments of mechanization, including photographs of the first machines for kneading tea, and some early-day artefacts, its old photos. 
The factory has been substantially transformed and we are in its old building which was turned into a museum. Perhaps the most interesting part of the exposition is this one that tells about the USSR and Russia. Let's see. This map shows the expansion of the territory from which the factory collected tea for further processing. And here's a very interesting photo of the Soviet tea testers who came here in the 1950s, more precisely in September of 1952. They participated in the mechanization of the tea factory and did the research. It's remarkable that similar processes took place in Georgia at the same time and many Georgian and Soviet specialists came here to set up collaborative relationships. Here's an old brick on which Anhua brick tea is written in Russian. It seems to me that that's why we're now witnessing brick teas of Georgian manufacture, very similar to this one. This is all thanks to the cooperation with China. There's also a brick of HR of 1952 marked as special tea for export to the Soviet Union. After the death of Stalin and the advent of Khrushchev's rule, our relations deteriorated and cooperation ceased. From that moment the Chinese tea import was stopped and our whole country drank mostly Indian teas for quite a long time. If this had not happened, then perhaps HR would have been the most famous tea in modern Russia. Here are samples of the tea produced at the factory. These are standard factory probes which are deposited every year from each batch. The box is signed year and which kind of raw material it is. This is the first batch of 1970s tea, real historical artifacts. More interesting exhibits, sawn ancient tea trees of HR. I didn't know there used to be such ancient tea trees here, almost the same as in Yunnan. These are several examples of cuts and leaves from them, which are no less than the Yunnan large leaf breed from Menghai. <laughs>